Welcome to Casual Friday. So I have a couple of projects that I'm currently working on and some books to share with you and maybe a few other things. So let's get started. As always, I have links to the different sections of the video down in the, in the description below if you want to jump from one topic to another. So last week I was telling you about the flack, the follow the leader Aaron knit along where that was a really great transition project for me from just following a pattern to designing a pattern because the stitch patterns had been selected and then we were kind of guided through the process of, of measuring and figuring out what it was we wanted and then we can knit the sweater. Now this sweater was knit top down starting at the saddles. Um, and I have, I prefer to knit the body bottom up and then the sleeves top down. Um, and that's probably what I'll do for the sweater I'm currently designing. But I, I promise to share with you sort of my design process as I go through it. And uh, so I'm going to show you in the overhead what I'm starting with and where I am in that project currently. So when I knit an Erin sweater, I like to have, use peasant sleeves or the modified drop shoulder sleeve. I don't use set-in sleeves. You can, I just don't. Sometimes I use saddles um, and those saddles st start at the neck and then they run down the center of the sleeve all the way down. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do that, but I know the general shape that I'm going to have. I know that I want the sweater to be 40 inches in circumference, which means it's going to be 20 inches wide. And I know I want the shoulders to be 15 inches wide at the top. And so that means I'm going to have to lose two and a half inches at each underarm um, when I reach that point. That also means that one of the things that I would like to happen is for the filler stitch on the sides be at least as wide as the underarms probably come in a little more so that the total width of all of the cables is going to be about 14 inches wide. That, that works well for most adult sweaters and then you can just use as much filler stitch as you want and then uh, you don't have to do anything about decreasing your cables out when you do the underarm. So I know that this is the shape I want and I know that I want the center panel to be pretty wide, somewhere between five to eight inches wide. And then um, the side cables are going to probably be, each be about two or three inches wide. So I've written here Fibonacci and that is because Fibonacci sequences are really handy to use when you're designing. Whether you're designing something that's striped and you want to use numbers in the Fibonacci sequence that uh, correlate to those numbers, um, or if you're making uh, vertical panels and you want those to somehow correlate to Fibonacci numbers. I like to knit this type of sweater, a cabled sweater flat from the bottom up for the body and then to work the sleeves top down and I don't mind working those in the round but the body I really like to work flat um, because I get the rust rows the wrong side rows uh, I, I just knit my knits and purl my pearls for the most part I don't worry about miscrossing cables ca crossing them a row too early or a row too late because uh, I, I have a wrong side row to uh, give me that confidence so I know I'm going to start with this so I usually start by uh, picking what I want for the center panel. So I went through a bunch of different stitch dictionaries and I decided that what I wanted was some sort of lattice type of, of, of uh, cable. Something that uh, Barbara Walker calls them cable stitch patterns and they're patterns that have cables in them but they can be widened and so they can uh, they can get wider and wider and here I've got something fairly narrow. This is the narrowest this particular cable can be. I thought maybe I would want it um, to be a little bit wider so I charted, charted out. So I, I swatched it out in this size to see how big it actually came out and decided I didn't really want it any wider than that. What I've got over here are some ideas that I had for cables that might work with it and then the filler stitch I have over here. I really like moss stitch as my filler. I use it a lot. I just I like the fact that it's a four row repeat 
that the wrong side rows are worked the same as the right side row uh, so that I don't have to think about that. So this is not what the sweater is actually going to look like. I, I have settled, I think, on this as my central panel. One of the things I, I sometimes do is I try to call back elements of the central panel um, in some of the other panels. I don't want to do it too much because I don't want it to be super boring. And in this case, I don't think this works. This is the upside down version of that. I, I don't really like that. Um, and I was experimenting with some other narrow uh, patterns that I could use to, div to separate different stitch elements and also or to frame them. Um, so these really narrow things are nice to have, whether it's a one stitch uh, a twist. Here's a, I did this one on a size five needle and decided it was not firm enough and so then I went down to a size four and I think this is the the fabric that I'm going to use. So I uh, did some additional swatching. I thought this particular cable maybe I could I could mirror them and put them side by side and then divide them with a, a twisted stitch instead. So you have a, a, a one stitch divider, you've got a two stitch divider, this is a four stitch divider. These are really nice um, when you have to add a few more extra stitches and you don't want to just add more filler stitch. You can make the the cable panel section a little bit wider by adding some of these elements. Now when I was swatching, um, this is like a honeycomb cable, but it's like a single column of them. So they're, they're, sing they're two stitch cables. So this one's pointing in and that one's pointing that way. And then the next time they go out and they in, out and in, out. And I was using an easier way of doing two stitch twists to see if I liked the result. And I, um, I didn't. So when I, um, swatched on the smaller needle, I used an actual cable crossing method um, that I think I like the result of better. I still don't know if I'm going to use this or not. And, you know, I'm still playing, playing with these. So let me show you what I do with my charts. So I find, I find the cables that I like, and then I chart them out in my charting software to see what I think. So originally, you can see I used the cable that I had here. I had two columns of those. Um, I had a two stitch uh, twist dividing them and then these were flanked by the honeycombs and I had um, some more two stitch cables. These are mirrored. Um, that was okay. It was kind of boring. In this version, I still I maintained uh, the upside down version of this cable, but then I added the offset cable. Uh, I liked that a little bit more. Here's the version where I tried a wider version of that central panel and then just one cable. I, I just didn't want one that was that wide. Oh, and in this, this one, again, I used this cable, two of them, separated them with um, and framed them with a single twist and then another framing of the honeycomb. So, and then finally I did this, and I, so I did that second swatch. So then I did, this swatch has this honeycomb, and it has these divided by the single twist, and just to see, just to see what I think. I'm just not there yet. I have an idea of what I want to do um, to change some things here, but I just, I haven't gotten there yet. The, this was the original swatch that I did for my flax sweater. And th this is what the cable layout was. And you can see that these cables were all pointed in the same direction. You can see that these snake cables were the same. And I ended up from my sweater uh, turning the center cable upside down and mirroring these cables. So this sweater was designed by Janet Zabo in part of that workshop. So you can see here I ended up um, flipping one of them upside down. These here are mirrored on either side and then they're mirrored again over here. Oh, and then the another thing that I did was to extend some of the cables. I really like uh, doing that. I just like that that flow that some of the smaller cables have going from the ribbing into the body. In this case, I was working top down, so they went from the body into the ribbing. This is a swatch that I did for uh, the sweater I knit. A uh, sweater I knit for my husband, and in this case, I again I used that moss stitch filler, but it. It was something I also used in these diamonds that in the center I had the uh, moss stitch and the diamonds and 
it gets called back in the filler stitch and then I have these uh, rope cables that twist to the right here and I did a column of rope cables here. So these have some quite different cables and then there's this callback to these ropes and the callback to the moss. So this I really liked and I'm not quite there yet with, with, um, with the sweater I'm working on right now. I, I, um, I have some ideas for for what I'm going to try next and then so next week I can I can update you with my swatches. Now this is not the yarn I'm going to be knitting my sweater with. This is the yarn that I have in my stash. Uh, it's the same weight as the yarn I purchased for my pattern or for my sweater. It's a lighter color and I have quite a bit of it. So I didn't buy an extra skein like I normally would of this yarn I bought from Ireland. I bought nine hanks of the yarn that I'm going to knit the sweater with and it's a very dark yarn which is one of the reasons that I didn't want to swatch with it. I wanted to really be able to see what was going on. But I do have a concern with that really dark yarn that I don't want to do anything too intricate for one thing. I want to keep things as easy as possible so that I, it's easy for me to knit but it's also so that I, I don't waste complexity on uh, a sweater where you can't see the results. So while I found the, the, the workshop, the Follow the Leader Aaron Knit Along workshop, really valuable for learning how to kind of design my own things, um, the woman who, who did that workshop also, her name is Janet Zabel. She wrote this book, Aaron Sweater Design. And I've been going back through it because I, you know, a lot of what I've been doing, I've just been going on memory. I have knit other Aaron sweaters that I've designed for, like for the master hand knitting program. So I haven't gone back and looked at this book again until now. And I'm like, cause I'm kind of stuck on a few of the cable panels and what I really want to do. I don't love it yet. And so is reviewing some of the tips that she had in here for how to combine different cable patterns together and some strategies that you can use um, to make sure it's not too boring and to make sure that it's not too jarring, um, which are really helpful. What's really nice about this book is that although this sweater was knit completely top down, she doesn't require you <laughs> to do that. If you like knitting bottom up or top down or the hybrid like I do, you can use this book. She has instructions and schematics for uh, a basic drop shoulder sleeve, a modified drop shoulder, satin sleeve. You can do either any of those with and without uh, saddle shoulders if you want. So it's got a lot of really great information on that as well as tips for things like baubles which are pretty traditional things to include in the Aran sweater. Tips for making those baubles um, really stand out. So this is a really good reference source if you are planning on designing your own Aran sweater. And I'll put a link down in the description. So another good uh, source for learning more about Aaron sweaters is Alice Starmore's book. This is the second edition. It's an expanded edition. And what, what's really nice in this book is that she gives a history of not only the of Aaron sweaters, but the Aaron Islands in particular and knitting within the Aaron Islands. And she she thoroughly dispels the myth that and, and myth it is. Um, that was created around Aaron sweaters. Aaron sweaters, as we know them today, the white cabled sweaters, um, are really a, sort of a, an invention, a marketing machine um, in the mid-century. So the other project I'm working on is that ladies sweater that I found in the in the newspaper in the 1906 newspaper uh, I was telling you about it last year and I, I just I was reading through the instructions and I was sort of visualizing most of what was going on and then it got to the point where like I couldn't quite figure out what they were doing because what they were doing in the back did not match what they were doing in the front and so I started sketching it out and I'll, I'll put in the overhead a, a sketch of, of what I figured out. So I want to show you what it is I'm knitting and and kind of why I decided to knit. I just, um, well first of all this Aaron sweater that I'm designing, it's going to take a while um, for, for, that for me to really kind of lock in how I want that design to be and so I need something to knit in the meantime. And, and 
these historic sweaters are so interesting to me. The construction method and then also some of the stitch patterns or stitch patterns I haven't seen before or done in ways that, that I hadn't seen before that I find really intriguing. And I think it's really worth it for me to just get through the process of knitting one of these sweaters so I can really understand what's going on. So let me just show you what's happening. So this sweater, this sweater is called a zigzag sweater and and it gets its name from the stitch pattern, which is a 10 stitch repeat that um, it's knit five, purl five basically, and then it staggers uh, each row uh, for five rows in one direction and then it goes back in the other direction. And so I expect that this will lie flat once it's been steamed, but in the meantime, look at how it folds up. It's basically a form of ribbing. Um, there is a single column, so the, the, the part that is mostly um, knit is the parts that are coming forward, like the, the pr this part is predominantly knit with some pearls in it. And there's a single column of knit that never is purled. And in the valleys, you have a single column of what is pearls on this side, of course it's knit on that side. But it creates this really sort of corrugated look which surprised me. So the way these sweaters work, they start out very tiny at the bottom. These were corseted ladies of the Gilded era, of the Edwardian era. Let me get some pins. So it starts out really tiny at the bottom and, and it goes straight for a while and then you start to get increases. And so you have um, the full width of the back appears right right here. And then you get some armhole decreases. There's no bind offs here. There's just decreases right here. And it's going to continue to be worked all the way up to the back, uh, all the way up to the neck. And then we're going to knit some of the stitches and then bind off the back stitches. And then these stitches get left on hold. And then what happens is that this gets knit for, um, couple of inches right here and then you cast on enough stitches that it's going to reach all the way back over to here and then you'll knit straight for a while and then you're going to cast on about four inches worth of stitches that are going to create that underarm depth right here we didn't have any binding off for on the back underarm so the the back seam is really going to be at the edges of the back and the, all of the underarm depth right here is provided by the front of the sweater. So you add that in there and then you, you, you knit straight for a while and then you're going to create what they call a pouch because in the Edwardian era they had kind of a pigeon breasted um, looks. They had and they had this pouch and a lot of and a blousing that came down um, where the ribbing met. So the ribbing is super tight and then and then your blouse blouses out or the sweater in this case is going to blouse out. And what happens when you get down to about here is then they have you start working short rows. So you come to about the midpoint of the depth of the underarm here and then you start going back and forth to get shorter and shorter and shorter rows um, until you get to the front and then you decrease a bunch of stitches so that you create this gathered um, pout. So you have the full length right here that's more than you need and so it gets gathered up and then over here it's shorter from the short rows. So it may be confusing to understand this but I do have a, I did draw it out and I'll put a drawing on the overhead. But then you come back to the shoulder and you do the same thing here and you're casting on again that full width. And so at some point <laughs> you knit this, at the end you knit a collar, very tall collar that goes all the way around. And then the tricky part here is how this is supposed to be uh, joined together, like how much, if any, overlapping is there? Um, because the finishing instructions, I think, are assuming that you know something about the fashion of that era, which I do not, and I'm trying to learn. So part of this is just to understand how these, these uh, techniques are all working together to create this garment. Now, I looked at a number of other sweater patterns from within a year or two before and after this particular pattern was created and they all have that same construction method where they start at the back, they come over the shoulders and continue down. And the stitch patterns that they use 
um, are reversible and in, in, you know, in sort of, um, they don't look like they're upside down once they come over the shoulder. So this zigzag is going to look the same, um, whether it's coming in this direction or that direction. I saw another pattern that had cables that started here and the cables are going to look the same, whether they're right side up or upside down. And what was interesting about those cables was that they established the pattern here. It was uh, purl two, knit two, purl two, and then a knit five, and then the purl two, knit two, purl two, knit five. So they established the pattern that way at this narrow part. And then they knit like 10 rows of just that kind of unusual ribbing pattern. And then they crossed the cables and the five stitch columns. And they did an increase while they did that to create six, a uh, six stitch cable. And then uh, and then, so every 12 rows, they're doing a cable crossing with an increase until they're up to eight stitches. And then they maintain the eight stitch cable all the way down the front. So that increase was really interesting to me and it's one of the increases I showed in, in Tuesday's technique video. So I've been, I've been talking about this sweater in, in last week's Casual Friday thread on my Ravelry group and people have been asking questions about it and I've been posting a few pictures of, of my progress and and somebody sent a link to a book. It's in, our, I think it's archives.org. I'll put a link down below. But it's to a pattern book that was produced in 1904. This is the book. It's, it's got the Library of Congress stamp in it. So this is a, a digitized scan of um, a 1904 book put out by the Columbia Yarn Company. And it has this pattern in it. What's interesting is that the drawing is a little different. It reflects more this kind of interesting zigzaggy um, fabric that that this that this has more so than the picture that was in the newspaper. Now, these other pat sweater patterns I've been finding in the newspapers are all in the same 1904 book, including some others. So again, I'm going to leave you a link and it's really interesting to see some of these sweater patterns. And it's, and it's a big book. It's full of crochet and it's full of knitting. And, and it, so it's interesting to compare sweaters that are similar but have different stitch patterns to see what this structure is like. And what, what I really liked about it was that, that the book actually included information about what needle size to use. Now, I, I, there's not any information in any of these about gauge occasionally, but they will tell you what yarn to use. And so then I found a website that explained what all of the old Columbia yarns were, like how what the yardage was, uh, how many plies it had, um, what sort of yarn weight we would consider it today so that when you read one of these old patterns you can kind of get an idea at least of what the gauge likely is going to be. For some of these patterns usually what the pattern says is it's for a specific bust size usually 36 but sometimes 34 or 38. If it's for a uh, misses for them, back then, misses meant a young girl, like a teen. So they had one that was for a 28 inch bust. And then at the end, they explained what you had to do to increase it for, for larger uh, bust sizes. And that is helpful for figuring out um, what the gauge likely is as well. And because the back, that back measurement, it only goes right up to the back. It doesn't include the side measurements. And because of all the blousing, it can be a little difficult to try to figure out what the finished size actually is. So, and then again, for other patterns, they mention that, oh, if you want to increase or decrease, um, subtract five stitches for every inch you want to change it. So that tells you that the gauge is five stitches per inch. So I did figure out that this, this sweater was supposed to be knit in worsted weight yarn um, and probably at five stitches per inch. So that would have been really handy information to just be given. But what's really important is the row gauge because these are patterns where they're not telling you knit to this many inches. They're telling you knit this many pattern repeats. So they're expecting that you're getting a particular row gauge in order um, to make that number of repeats. So it, this is just a really interesting, somebody was asking me, oh, are you going to wear this with a corset? And I said, I'm not going to wear this thing at all. I'm going to try it on because I think there's a chance I'll be able to get it on. But I'm mostly interested in the construction of it and, and the techniques used. Like it uses short rows, but it doesn't use wrap and turn short rows. It just has you turn 
and it doesn't have you keep all the stitches on the needle. It has you knit until your two stitches from, you know, from the end of the needle and then just put those two stitches on another needle. So they have you keep collecting all of the stitches that you're not working in your short rows. They have you collecting them on a spare needle, which I thought was, was interesting. And then because at the end of all of those short rows, you're getting ready to transition to ribbing, then they have you do a bunch of mass decreases and not just a bunch of knit two together. They're like knit three together and knit four together until you are in and then we want you to result in a total number of stitches of this. They're not telling you <laughs> where to place those decreases or if you should spread them out. They're not telling you any of that. So I think part of that is because if you have knit this style of sweater before, you would know where those decreases are located. I think they're all located in the span of stitches that were short rowed based on reading some of the other sweater patterns, but I'm not 100% sure. That's part of why I want to do this. I'm just really interested in some of the stitch patterns that I haven't seen before and also the construction techniques um, that we don't use these days and how that could really sort of enhance creativity in contemporary knitters by just borrowing ideas from the historical knitter. So I, I checked this book out of the Textile Center a few weeks ago and I just started reading it. Um, it's called Women's Work, The First 20,000 Years. Someone recommended this to me in the comments a while back and I thought, oh, that sounds <clears throat> really interesting. She'd used it, I think, for, she was working on her master's degree and she used this book as a reference and it's still available, it's still in print. I'll leave a link down below. So what she's talking in here is about textiles and how that has been women's work for thousands of years. Why that is and how that um, helped women economically in some situations and in others basically enslaved them. And so I'm just getting started on it. But one of the first things that she's talking about is that she had seen in a museum a piece of plaid that was from thousands of, and thousands of years ago that had been woven by the ancestors of the Celts. So it was like in Austria, Hungary area thousands of years ago and they were weaving these plaids that you still see and they had hats that were in the shape of tam o shanters th that you still see like in Scotland and in, in France and stuff. So these are those are the ancestors of, of these people, the French and the Scots. And so they had this little scrap of weaving and all the salvages were gone. So you really couldn't tell which direction it had been woven. And she wanted to recreate this piece of weaving. And she'd worked all day long with her sister on getting the warp set up. It was a two person job. And, and then she started weaving finally after eight hours of getting the warp set up it was really complicated. And then she started weaving the weft and then she realized, oh, this had been woven in the opposite way so that the warp w would have been set up in a very simple way and the weft and allowing the weaver to vary how many rows that she used with this particular color and doing it by eye. But it was, she said it was this act of recreating something that had been done thousands of years ago that 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 made her understand more fully what was going on and that and when I read that I thought that is what I'm trying to do with this historical sweater I feel weird that I'm knitting it at first I really was waffling about should I knit this oh I really want to knit this should I knit this I really want to knit this and I have I have this stash of yarn in a color that was the result of some unfortunate online shopping I remember I just I was in this a uh, couple times a year I go online shopping for yarn and I just start buying yarn and I bought this solid color yarn and I and it came in the mail and I looked at it and I'm like why did I buy this color I I don't I don't want this and so it's been sitting here and I've been tempted a few times to give it away to the textile center garage sale or to the knitters guild uh, silent auction and it's just been sitting here and I thought you know what this is the perfect yarn to use for this it's not a sweater I'm going to wear um, it gives me a way to use this yarn instead of feeling bad about having it in my stash and it gives me something to do while I'm working on the design for this Aran sweater 
I'll keep you updated. It's probably going to be a month or two of work on both of these sweaters. Um, but I'll keep you updated as I make progress on each of them. And so you can see how the design process continues for me with the Aaron sweater. And you can see how I finally get to understand how this Edwardian sweater is constructed. I really appreciate those of you who enjoy my casual Fridays and I want to give a big thank you to all of you who have supported me on Kofi.com this fall. Um, it makes me uh, feel wonderful that you get so much out of my podcast because I certainly get a lot out of creating them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next year.